Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to welcome you all. My name is David Albertson. I'm the executive director of Nova Forum, who's sponsoring this event. I'm also an associate professor of religion here at the University of Southern California. I'll be passing it off to the person who will be introducing our guest speaker today. Nova Forum is a community of faculty and students at USC who are interested in bringing the long Catholic intellectual tradition into dialogue with the modern universities. We have a whole wide range of events, film, this particular series, we have you know, things in history, film, all sorts of different things. And this particular series is on religion and science. And under those auspices, we're glad to have our speaker here today. Um, the individual who will be introducing our speaker is to give a warm welcome from a community member and alumna to our speaker, Frank Thank you. Hi everyone, Frank Pascali is an important contributor to the conversation on what it means to be human in the 21st century. He is an expert on the law of AI, algorithms, and machine learning. He's recognized globally as an influential scholar, known particularly for his work addressing the regulation of technology across internet, healthcare, and finance industries. Frank also takes up the very important work of, in his own words from his second book, laying the foundation for what is known as anticipatory social research, designed to shape technological advances instead of merely responding to them, as we see too often in data and privacy related issues. Frank has advised a long and impressive list of business and government leaders, the US National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, the US Department of Health and Human Services, the US House Judiciary and Energy and Commerce Committees, the Senate Banking Committee, the Federal Trade Commission, and Directorates General of the European Commission. He has also served on a council for big data, ethics, and society, as well as the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics as a chair of the Privacy, Confidentiality, and Security Subcommittee. Frank is the Jeffrey D. Forcelli Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School, an affiliate fellow at Yale University's Information Society Project, and a member of the American Law Institute. He is co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cross-Disciplinary Research in Computational Law, based in the Netherlands, and a member of an Australian Research Council Center of Excellence on Automated Decision-Making and Society. Frank's first book, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information, was released in 2015 and has been widely recognized as a crucial study in information law, focusing on reputation, search, and finance, Frank shows, in his own words, how authority is increasingly expressed algorithmically and offers reforms to advance rather than curtail our freedoms and our understanding of the social world. Five years after its publication in 2020, the journal Big Data and Society held an interdisciplinary symposium on the Black Box Society. The symposium revisits the political economy of big data in the wake of more recent events, such as the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal. I highly recommend it. Frank's second book, New Laws of Robotics, Defending Human Expertise in the Age of AI, practically reimagines the relationship between AI and humans across various professional fields. Frank updates a question posed by Joseph Weizenbaum, considered one of the founders of AI, and discusses again, in his own words, what sociotechnical mix of humans and robotics best promotes social and individual goals and values. In turn, he offers a future where AI and robotic systems make labor more valuable instead of less valuable by complementing, not replacing human experts. New Laws of Robotics was a finalist for the American Association of Publishers Prose Award in the Legal Studies and Criminology category. Aside from his two celebrated books, which are no small feat, Frank has also co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Ethics of AI, co-authored a casebook on administrative law, and published various other law and technology articles featured in top law reviews. Though some technophiles suggest automating attorney's work, Frank is dedicated to preserving accountability in law with the human responsible and legal decisions expressed in language and ensuring the rule of people instead of machines. On a personal note, 
I strongly admire Frank's ability to recognize and avoid, recognize and avoid the pitfalls of techno utopia or techno dystopia. Having seen the extremes of these while working in big tech, it is inspiring and frankly reassuring um, to see Frank envision a more balanced future where humans cooperate with technology. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. And without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to our speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patty. That was really one of the most thoughtful introductions I have ever had. I'm really deeply grateful to you for uh, putting that all together in such a, a generous way. And my many thanks as well to the Nova Forum, to Matt, to David, to others you know, who have invited me here and hosting. It's just terrific to be here. And so without further ado, let's uh, jump into the future of AI and law. Um, and I think we're going to take sort of a broader philosophical perspective today, um, but I want to be sure to start with some very concrete phenomena in AI and law. So the plan of talk, what I want to get across today is first, what is computational thinking? You know, when we think about when, when people are invited to law school, a lot of times they're told, well, you're in law school to think like a lawyer. Uh, does computational thinking mean thinking like a computer? Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. And sort of, or is it about being able to talk to computers, to get machines to understand what we want and to get them to do what we want. And when we think about it in that way, I think it can bring a lot to law, but also we have to worry about essentially law being made in the image of computation when in fact, it's just as much of a humanity, a part of the humanities as an engineering problem. And part of their, my inspiration for this whole project was sort of thinking about responding to those that tried to characterize law as a form of engineering. Uh, there's a book by David Howard called Law as Engineering. There's a lot of efforts now to sort of push uh, things like law as code, code as law. And I think that as those things gain traction, they're exciting in some ways. And you know, there might be aspects of say the tax system that could be totally computable. But on the other hand, um, as I uh, mentioned in a forward to a book called Is Law Computable? Um, there's a certain resilient fragility to law. In a sense, the law is resilient and it's resilient precisely because it has this sort of way of adapting to uh, human affairs and human free will. So I think that's part of the argument today. And also what I want to think about are what are non-computational methods of thought and practice in law? The reason I bring that up is because a lot of my sort of uh, uh, thinking in this area has been a critique of uh, what Antoinette Rouvroy calls algorithmic governmentality. When algorithms are used to govern human behavior, to sort of make us understand how we should conduct ourselves. But I once was presenting this um, actually uh, at uh, my own law school and one of my colleagues said, Frank, isn't all thinking algorithmic? Like, aren't you just essentially being a uh, uh, advocate for irrationalism when you attack algorithms? I was like, whoa, you know, that's quite a critique, <laughs> quite, a, quite an accusation. And so I felt like I actually uh, want to, and what I've been trying to do over the past you know, three years or so uh, after the, I published the New Laws of Robotics book was to think about what is non-algorithmic thought? Right? Can we sort of think about that as a form of thought to complement algorithmic thought? Um, and I'll get into some, some of the ways in which we could do so uh, in today's talk. Um, I should also note that you know part of the motivation for this talk is something I call the AI uh, ultimatum. So um, a, a roboticist, uh, Ilan Orbach, has written this uh, book called Robot Futures. And then he says, you know, familiar devices will become more aware, more interactive, and proactive. Eventually, we will need to read what they write. You know, and I think when he wrote that, people might have been saying, well, really, we're really going to have to do that. But I have to say, some days on Twitter or Mastodon, um, I feel like half of what I'm reading is people's prompts for G chat GPT. You know, like, check out this thing, check out this contract that chat GPT just wrote, et cetera. And so really, this is what seemed like a rather out there prophecy, you know, as of like five, 10 years ago, now seems quite immediate and important. Um, also, you know, uh, robot creatures sharing our spaces. We'll talk a little bit about those sorts of robot creatures, robot security guards uh, in the army, uh, robot warriors, et cetera. And I think that the problem becomes on what terms, right? On what terms are we going to be sharing spaces with uh, robots, drones, other uh, potentially uh, semi-autonomous or autonomous uh, forms of machinery? Um, there's actually a really interesting article by Zach Colangelo and Michael Frumkin on the potentiality of having a right to shoot down a drone that comes in your backyard, right? The law is going to have to answer that sort of a question. Uh, and I think actually a, 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 someone in Kentucky actually did shoot down a drone and sort of went over his swimming pool uh, about five years ago. So those sorts of questions of like, how much do we share? 
the sky, the right of way, other things with say a sidewalk robot, with other forms of, of AI are gonna be more and more important for time. Now, the other thing that's happening, you know, is it's, it's very easy to concretize this and to imagine it in the form of like a robot, a drone, some sort of uh, entity, mechanical entity out there with uh, artificial brain. But I also wanted to note that like the real advance in AI is what is often called narrow AI over a narrow set of problems or predictions. And I think that if you compare some of these things like traditional approaches to problems and how they're challenged or enhanced by technology, I'm giving you here a broader phenomenon of what I call the digitization of judgment. Law is only one of many professions affected by this digitization of judgment, right? And I think to understand how law is being affected by it, what I'm usually thinking about in my work is how does law regulate things like medicine or employment or medicine or uh, uh, social uh, networks in this case, et cetera. Um, but I also started to turn this uh, telescope back on law itself, but just to help you know, contextualize what I'm gonna be talking about with lawyers. You know, the traditional approach to the problem like with hiring is you have a human resource department, you're looking over the resumes, reading resumes, maybe skimming resumes to be honest, um, and, and talking to people. So there'd be an effort to develop some sort of rapport to figure out if someone is going to be a good employer. Nowadays, you happen to have algorithmic resume sorters who can just look through, they could have, say, a pile of resumes that would be the firm's most successful people. Say they've got 100 most successful people there, or 250 or so. And then you might have 10,000 resumes coming in. And they might use natural language processing to say, which of these 10,000, which of these 10,000, like maybe 200 you could give an interview to, who look the most like the successful interviews, right? And we are the successful resumes, the resumes of the people that are the most successful at the firm. That's a really different world to be part of. And of course it invites hacking, right? One of the hacks that some people were doing is they were putting in, um, on their digital resumes, putting in white font of prestigious universities all over where there was blank spaces. The computer, <laughs> so the computer would read, you know, whatever the university might be, and it would come out and, and, and would sort of give them the, whatever the points was for similarities for that. Um, but no, no person looking at the resume would be able to see this white font uh, sort of thing, right? So that's an early example of like how you can defeat computational thinking. I think a lot of the, the weaknesses, problems of computational thinking help emerge from these types of defeat devices, you know? Um, also, there was recently someone that, uh, there was someone who published an article on adversarial machine learning that showed that like, if you added two pieces of duct tape to a stop sign, or if you added two ducks, pieces of duct tape to a stop sign, a um, uh, self-driving car would recognize it as a 45 mile per hour sign, right? So that's pretty amazing that that sort of thing can happen. Now, you know, so, and I'm not saying that defeats AI, but I'm just saying that like, it does sort of show its, its weakness in sort of uh, having forms of intuition. Same, for example, like uh, with, say, having a suicide prevention hotline, that's waiting for people to call. There are now things, algorithms on Facebook that are alerting Facebook on Facebook to concerning posting behavior. So that's really a, a, an interesting development. Um, over 2,000 people have had police calls to their homes on the basis of just these sort of algorithmic guidelines. Um, I can talk later about other uh, potential uses of these algorithms. Um, we'll talk in a bit about predictive policing algorithms. And you know, last version that I just want to talk about to give you a sense of the stakes is that you might have, say, an intensivist at the intensive care unit deciding who would uh, get continued care and who wouldn't. And nowadays, you could also have an algorithm that would, say, give the percent likelihood that someone with a certain set of vital signs would live beyond more than 30 days beyond their current. So these are all things that you know are evolving as forms of the digitization judgment, and they're really putting a lot of pressure on law. Now, before I get into the law example in particular, just to give another sense of the stakes, um, this is from Hod Lipson, um, a quote from Hod Lipson who says, he's a roboticist at Columbia who said, I think we're definitely losing ground to algorithms um, that computers are becoming so good at what they do that they're gonna have a hard time explaining how well they predict or accomplish things in the world. And when Facebook demands for explainable AI, for the AI to explain how it makes certain decisions, said, well, it's like explaining Shakespeare to a dog. This is a very provocative framing. He was actually also recently uh, profiled in the New York Times for uh, advocating for robot consciousness. Okay, so I think these, these ideas sort of come together. They have elective affinities in many ways. And I think that what I want to challenge is to say, well, 
In some cases, I'm willing to accept that the prediction machine may be better and inexplicable. Um, but in others, and I think particularly in law, when law imposes benefits and burdens, we need explainability. Why is that? Why do we need further explainability? Well, and, and I think it's important, first of all, because there's so many books out there that are pushing the idea that uh, robots, AI, et cetera, are going to either end the professions or severely limit their applicability or sort of make, take over lots of knowledge work, right? And I, I'm trying to develop a counter narrative to that. Um, Part of the Carroll narrative is to think about what are the missing pieces of computational processes, right? There's a classic book by Hubert Graham that's called What Computers Can't Do. I have the revision of it, but computers still can't do it, <laughs> which was, I think that the books were separated by 30 years. And he sort of develops a, a list of things that are difficult for computers to do. Other authors, I'd say like Collins and myself, we look a lot at what computers shouldn't do. So we say maybe computers can do all sorts of things. You know, maybe they can take over as chatbot mental health therapist. Maybe they can take over uh, doing certain forms of social work, certain forms of care work, other things. What should they be doing? Right? What are the human values at stake? Um, and then I think these two books on the other side, in terms of Weizenbaum and Smith, you know, they sort of they, they both focus on this idea of judgment, right? The idea of judgment here uh, from judgment to calculation. And there's this, this beautiful sort of analogy being set up here, right? Between computer power and reason, calculation and judgment. Power, calculation, judgment, reason, et cetera. And I want to I want to play with those ideas today. Sort of think about how law depends on certain forms of judgment that are really difficult to really reduce to what Weisenbach calls calculation, what the University of Toronto uh, philosopher Brian Campbell Smith calls reckoning. Okay, so we get into these ideas. Um, initial example. Okay, this is, this is all the 10,000 uh, view or 30,000 uh, foot view stuff. Now I want to get into the law. Here's a real live controversy that's happening right now. Um, is the role of algorithms in the criminal justice system. So you have authors like Andrew Guthrie Ferguson, and there's probably a dozen other legal authors I could mention in his place, that talk about the rise of big data policing and are very critical of it. Um, and we'll get into the critiques in a bit. But I want to start with actually Christopher Slobogan's book, Just Algorithms, which uh, is essentially saying we need more AI, uh, more computation, more quantitative analysis to improve our criminal justice system. What's the argument? Okay. Well, the argument starts with, we have discrimination in policing. Right? In many jurisdictions, police disproportionately inflict violence on minorities and minoritized communities. And this is something that he and Ferguson agree on 100%. I mean, I think in the legal community, there's, there's not much disagreement about some of these, these uh, uh, problems that we, we would see. And civilian review boards and courts can censure police overreach, but can algorithmic assessments help too? Why does that become a question? I think because, particularly because of some studies of judges that cast doubt on the validity and robustness of human reason. One of them is the Hungry Judges Study, which essentially is a study of Israeli judges, and it was, came out that... Um, the authors only looked at whether uh, how severe the sentencing was, or the punishment was, or how the judge came out versus uh, plaintiffs uh, versus uh, I'm sorry versus the people they were deciding on in general, um, and whether they and when they made the decision. And they found that in general, the closer you got to lunch, the harsher the judgment was. The judge had lunch, then became merciful. <laughs> so this is kind of amazing, right? This is a, a remarkable finding. Now, I will say that the Harvard Law Professor Holger Swaban has said he doesn't think that this could really be a robust finding, you know. And also, there's many ways to solve that problem, but he's kind of skeptical about the issue. The other one is the LSU football study, which I think is even more disturbing, which sort of says, talks about um, the severity of punishment by judges in Louisiana after uh, the weekend, the, the Monday after Louisiana State football events, which is more harsh. Know, and also harsher in a racially discriminatory way. That was what they came out of their big data analysis. So you get studies like that. Um, they become very, uh, they, they alert people. And so the idea is maybe we could do better using policing quantitative, or using quantitative analysis, et cetera, or risk assessment instruments. So Slobodin talks about these RAIs. And he says these algorithms help judges figure out whether arrested individuals should be released pending the trial. Well, what's the algorithm? Right, what's the algorithm that gets beyond the fragility of human reason? Well, the baseline, he says, about sentencing as done by humans now is convoluted front end calculations, where they're tempered or enhanced by a judge's speculative intuitions about the current risk of rehabilitation. Right? So, if that's your baseline, 
probably a computer could do a lot better. Probably a very simple computer could do better. And this is a constant sort of element of the AI in law literature is that a lot of what the legal legal system is doing now, it's not doing terribly well, right? You know, and so this leads to a demand for computation. And so his goal is to have risk needs algorithms that are essentially looking at whether offenders should stay beyond the minimum term of the sentence. And we're going to only subject them to prolonged restraints if they have a high risk. Well, how do we determine high risk? Well, these will about be among scoring points. So they can score points essentially with more of a criminal history. If they're younger, just to give you a sense of how age factors in, essentially it is discriminatory against younger people. Um, but I, I, I don't, I, maybe I, I should bracket discriminatory because there is some sense that like, it's less likely one is discriminatory. Exposed to the crimes, diagnosis, uh, perhaps mental health diagnoses, and also in some other areas, demographic traits and psychological factors. Sometimes, it's how many friends does the person have that are have been part of the prison system, etc. Right. So this is his vision, um, and he's sort of endorsing these sort of risk factors that come with a certain number of points and compute the sort of person's risk score. So rather than having to say a holistic and often unwritten but holistic assessment by a judge of how long they think the person should be in prison. You have something like this type of risk assessment. Now, the problem though is that as um, uh, Rashida Richardson and Jason Schultz and Kate Crawford have pointed out in an article called Dirty Data, a lot of the data that's being analyzed in the criminal justice system is coming from places where um, essentially there was a finding, a, a justice finding that there was a biased police practices. So the problem for them is that the data that is being used to inform the AI that's predicting how likely someone is to recidivate and therefore how much longer than the minimum term they should spend in prison, that that data is dirty because it's coming from departments that have a civil rights issue. So this, I think, is a real challenge. And then the problem comes down to, do you think that we need to recommit to this uh, algorithmic program of, say, trying to figure out what is the proper data, how to clean the data. In health law, we call it risk adjustment, right? We might do something like say, well, if this is a particularly discriminatory department, then we have to lower the weight of its data, or whatever it might be. Uh, but that sort of is the question that gets raised by Richardson, Schultz, and Crawford. But there's a problem, right? There's a problem essentially because it's really hard to figure out exactly how far did the dirty data go, right? If, for example, to give one example of predictive policing, Let's say if one department's data, which was uh, came out of uh, a bad civil rights record, informed another department's data that doesn't necessarily have the civil rights finding, then do we also clean up that data or try to respond to it? So these questions, I think, are as much art as science in data science, right? And if they are as much data, art as science, then they become as contestable as law itself um, in many, many areas. Just moving on a little bit further, I mean, this, I think, plays into a broader case against what Guido Noto Lodiega has called the dehumanization of decision making. And I like this sort of listing, you know, that he gives, right? He talks about how design choices, if we even if we are think that some algorithms can be better than or less biased than human beings, we might still have to ask these questions, right? Essentially, there could be design choices that can be used to how does come the system may be affected by the biases of data collection? That's the very data problem I just spoke about. That algorithms cannot balance biases on interpretation of data, and that there are biases in the ways that these learning algorithms are tuned, and they may be designed for one purpose, but put in the system was designed for other purposes. So these are just a general theory of why we might be scared about this quote unquote dehumanization of decision making. But I think they they are this is a nice counter to the hungry judges study. Right. And I feel like, you know, I have seen the Hungry Judges study everywhere. I've seen it discussed in so many places. I've seen it brought up, you know, by podcasters, newspapers, etc. cetera. Uh, I've never seen this study. And so I think the problem now is that, like, there's an effort, there's a need to sort of rebalance the dialogue about what's going on in law versus, say, uh, computer science. I also know that, you know, there are other problems of computation and shortcomings of it that have been exposed in various popular books or are books that are, are popularizing the scientific research the authors. I think each of these sort of show potential problems in say all of the forms of digitization of judgment that I mentioned, but also in law. Um, and I focus particularly on 
the Kathy O'Neill book, Muffins of Bad Destruction, a pretty notable book out there from 2016, which talks about the possibility of um, self-reinforcing bias in these systems. For example, you can imagine a predictive policing system that says to the police, focus on this neighborhood. Um, and then it turns out that just because they focus on that neighborhood, they get more arrests. And then when they get more arrests, then the neighborhood looks even more crime ridden, et cetera, et cetera. They need to sort of this predictive, this spiral. Um, I'd also note that, you know, the thesis of, Mer of Carolyn Criado Perez's Invisible Women is a very smart thesis and, and well documented about problems of women not being reflected often in health data or in uh, car crash data about how they design cars. So these are very smart books. That's a very uh, well documented argument. And artificial intelligence, I think, is a very subtle case about the difficulties of computers in understanding the world, understanding the big picture. And I think that that is, uh, and one of the things I give Rashard a lot of credit for is being a real skeptic about the uh, pace of self-driving cars back in 2017. I think if you think back to 2016, 2017, a lot of people were like, self-driving cars, right around the corner. <laughs> and Broussard was out there with the researchers, and she was like, I think it's going to take a longer time, folks. Uh, I think that she was born out of that. And I think uh, that book is a really nice example of bringing together that form of understanding, insight, intuition, and critique uh, about the powers of computation. There's also pre pressures for accountability in algorithm determinations. I co authored, or co edited, co edited uh, this book called Transparent Data Mining for Big and Small Data. Greek data for Black Lives is also working in this area. So I think there's a lot of folks advocating for transparency and algorithm accountability. Um, I also think it's important to perform a risk assessment of risk assessment. Okay? This, I think, is really critical. And this is probably what turned the tide on a lot of these risk assessments about uh, in, in the legal academy. Um, essentially, think back to the way that Simone was framing the question right, in terms of how we use risk assessment instruments to decide whether to put someone in prison, say, for two or five. 10 more years. Okay. Well, if the risk assessment says that essentially, but how do we perform a risk assessment of the risk assessment? How do we decide whether it worked? Well, one way we might say, decide whether it worked is to say, okay, did people who were in a data set that wasn't affected by the risk assessment, did they end up perform, uh, committing crimes earlier? Or did they end up uh, recidivating, et cetera? And one of the other ways that we might find out about whether, or try to determine whether it works or not, is to say, imagine that you had a group of people, let's see, do I have a marker? If you had a group of people where you had like, say, here's a group of prisoners that are with the risk assessment, and these are the ones that are given, say, a plus, and they have a shorter sentence. You have a group of, of prisoners who are part of this classification, and others who get a minus, and they get a longer sentence. And let's say that eventually there are more crimes committed by this group than this group. On the surface, you might say, wow, the risk assessment worked, right? Because you'd say, look, the people that got the shorter sentence that we didn't think would recidivate, they committed crest crimes, great. The people that we said, that we sort of stigmatized and saying, deserving a longer sentence, created more crimes, great. But the problem, though, is what if prison is a criminogenic environment? That becomes really difficult. And so then we have to question whether the risk assessment instrument has effectively become a self fulfilling prophecy. And you know, same thing comes up with bad credit scores, right? Somebody has a bad credit score, they might be forced to pay 10% interest, and then it's hard for them to repay. And then people who gave them a bad credit score say, well, see, you can't repay. You know, they didn't repay. So I think that's just one, you know, I, I think straightforward example of the limitations. Um, this leads me to something on the value of narrative intelligibility. Right? So I feel like Having just explained this, even though I admit it was a toy model when I was doing this, right? um, this sort of idea, but I think just explaining that gives you some form of narrative about what is happening to people as they're being processed by the system. And I think that one of the philosophers who I think is best at recognizing this is Charles Taylor. Um, I think just a really humanistic philosopher, a very, uh, has a very both a, a keen sense of both uh, secular and religious humanism. And the importance of his, one of his books is called a Catholic Modernity, is reflecting that. And I think that his talking about the value of narrative intelligibility, he mentions that even if we set aside, or I mean, what I draw from him is that even if we set aside these self fulfilling prophecy concerns, we have to think about how these systems are, are not just mere opinions. They're not just offering mere opinions about people. 
they're affecting how they're treated in the world. And we have to be able to narratively explain what's going on, right? And that I think is really critical because a lot of this stuff is being done in secret. A lot of like the risk assessments, for example, there's a case called uh, Wisconsin versus Loomis. We still don't know how the risk assessment was done. It was all a trade secret. And that I think is really problematic because it runs into what I think is the importance to the rule of law of something like narrative intelligibility. We are, I think as Taylor says in, in human agency language, our agency is very often expressed through our ability to, to uh, put into words, right? Um, and I think in the language animal, he sort of doubles down on uh, this idea, this idea of sort of being able to understand linguistically what's going on with judgment um, in systems like the law. All right, so that was sort of like the narrow AI prediction. Let's do something a little more uh, physical <laughs> in the physical world with um, automated violence and robots, uh, for example. Because I feel like this is another area where, which is quite important to sort of consider. And what I want to sort of think about in this hypothesis is what I've tried to develop in the first half of the talk is an idea of how we can challenge processes of computation as not being adequately validated, as being biased, or as lacking in uh, narrative intelligibility. So I think I've laid out those three problems in the relatively narrow area of using data for predictive policing and for um, uh, sentencing, for deciding on who should get along with sentence. What I want to do here is to think about how that type of critique translates into a real world where we increasingly are going to have the opportunity and have the uh, uh, development of automated systems for either uh, committing or preventing violence. Now, this item on the left slide is an item called a spring gun. Now, of any of the law students, I see some familiar faces, right? <laughs> familiar looks you put the spring gun, right? And, and with the spring gun, this is something that is essentially, uh, uh, imagine someone has a country house, they put a sign on it, says no trespassing. Unfortunately, someone opens the door, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they're burglars or maybe they're just looking for shelter from a storm and a gun is there and shoots them, right? These were became incredibly popular, strangely, or at least, you know, I've, I've read up on some of the, the technology of it. Apparently, they were very common to stop grave robbers, of all things, and, and so other things like that. And, and so there are cases, there have been a lot of, several cases on these. And in general, the cases say this is not allowed. Right? You can't do this sort of thing. There are narrow exceptions. Like I think if someone, if you can demonstrate that the person who gets shot by your spring gun was actually intending to do great harm to you, you're okay. That's pretty hard to prove, right? And so this is the, that's the wisdom of the common law um, in spring guns. You advance a little bit further and you have things like this security robot, the nine scope security robot, right? So this is a security robot that's been tried out in various places. So far, it's largely been used to take images of people, videotape people, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's sort of an ongoing sensor, alert other workers, alert security workers, or even the police to come to certain scenes. But even when we talk about that sort of alert, which I'm going to get into later on, there can be some high stakes to that, right? There was some controversy uh, in San Francisco a few years ago where the people for ethical treatment of animals actually had a lot where some homeless people were at. And they deployed some of these night scope robots to uh, sort of harass the or try to move the homeless persons along and sort of say, move along, you know, or sort of like beeping at them or doing things like that. And actually, people protested and uh, spread like barbecue sauce over the sensors to sort of keep the, the robot. So it was like this initial uh, citizen resistance against robot and robotization of security, et cetera. You know, and I thought that was an interesting sort of um, uh, issue. And I, I was thinking about, you know, out this issue of like protests, other areas, I think you're gonna see increasing interest in robotized and very precise use of force, right? And this, I wanted to just, uh, not to go on too much of a tangent, but um, a lot of the uh, theorists of punishment now say that you could, with given current tracking technology, um, you could pretty easily take a lot of people out of prison and just have them uh, be under house arrest for running around of time in their homes, thanks to, say, a robotization of a effective privatization of policing and jailing. You know? um, and would that be a better thing? Certainly given the violence in a lot of uh, US prisons or prisons uh, around the world, 
It seems yes. But authors like Ruha Benjamin have asked and said, is it really a step forward to try to develop technologies for the precise application of control, given that by cheapening force, they could make it much more widespread? That's what she really worries about. And I think she's quite prescient to worry about that. Um, and I think that there's something also to be said about, for example, you can imagine a future where rather than having the night scale robot, you can have drones that have something that is a modified uh, acoustical device. There are certain things that are used by police known as long range acoustical devices that can put out, say, a very precise amount of sound that is enough to be unbearably loud, but not enough to cause permanent damage to hearing. And so you can imagine a future where some combination of reading people's faces about how they look when they're approached by one of these acoustical devices, drones, et cetera, could be used. And you might say, well, that would be good because it prevents the possibility of, say, police being injured, police violence, protesters being injured, et cetera. It serves as this very surgical strike on protests that might be that the authorities decide are not appropriate. But on the other hand, again, this very technification and advance in the precision of the force raises really tough questions. I mean, in some ways, analogous to like questions raised by genetic engineering, right? If, we, if you become too precise and too perfect in your ability to control reality, right? the questions being asked about genetic engineering were about the ability to control the human genome. Here would be about the ability to control social space. I think they're really interesting and difficult questions. And I think for now, I am on the side of the people who are sort of pushing back against this stuff. I'm also on the side of people who really enjoy movies like, say, Vegan, which are about a, <laughs> a, a sort of a bizarre image imagination of this very well programmed protective robot. And the whole movie, I mean, not to give too much away, sorry for the spoilers. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it doesn't go well, right? I mean, essentially, if you have just a, even, even a very, very smart Android. Uh, can go very uh, haywire. And I uh, I have uh, a section of my book, the robotics book, which is essentially a, a sort of reflecting on uh, Ian McEwan's book, Machines Like Me, which imagines something, I think, somewhat similar to me, um, and uh, in a more sedate, uh, British way, uh, imagines a way in which it could go utterly awry. Um, uh, again, sorry for the spoilers. But I highly recommend that, that novel, movies like this, because I think they envision something. They're able to envision um, sort of three or four or five steps ahead. Whereas like the mine run of regulation of this stuff is just looking a little bit ahead. That's always was sort of a, a bit of disappointment in some of my more practical engagements in government which are advising that you know, we're mentioning John Bernetti and other things. Like, it always seems like the, the, the regulators are just a few steps behind. You know, whereas like the people writing the sci-fi, et cetera, kind of envision the, the fullness of the potential problem, problems raised here. Um, I think one thing to note here is, you know, with the spring gun, one of the things that people would, would argue for with the robot is say, well, it can be more uh, sensitive than the spring gun, right? It can figure out whether someone is coming in with intent to kill or coming in just because they want shelter from the storm. But Elizabeth Joe says, no, wait a second, right? It, we really should watch out for that because even now these robots are far from being able to make those types of determinations. And that's exactly the same type of argument that's behind the campaign to stop killer robots. It's sort of the same campaign that's saying they're very, that you need to have a reasonable person being able to recognize things like children, innocent people, et cetera, or the thousands of other potential scenarios that could be analogous to a child opening that country house door and having a spring gun go off or something like that. That's sort of the argument of Elizabeth Joe there. Um, Another very practical example of this is something like software processing, say, asylum applications, right? Um, uh, in Europe, IBM, this was a, a headline from uh, Defense One, which is a very interesting you know, publication on the defense industry. And they talked about basically IBM saying to European authorities, look, you're overwhelmed by people coming from the Syrian war, from other you know, sort of conflicts in the region, et cetera. Um, uh, use our software, and it will immediately flag you. And one of the questions becomes, what is the baseline? And that needs to be elaborated more. But I think we should be suspect of that. And I mean, this is the headline and the image from the article. And I think already, even in the image that the article is giving, it has a certain stereotyped image of, say, who the uh, given person applying for asylum would be. And that, I think, could be built into the program. This is itself very problematic. 
Also in the bottom here is a certain form of, a tele, of, of a photograph or camera capacity that is being used uh, or that could be developed uh, in the desert uh, along the U.S. Uh, Mexican border as well uh, in terms of trying to figure out um, where persons are, et cetera, and automatically setting up uh, alerts. Now, I wanted to say that like, the reason why I, I, I want to bring up the core technology behind Okay, so I've talked about some very serious applications, but the core technology of it is something of just deciding, say, binaries, right? I've talked in all of the, the, the uh, distinctions that I've made here so far, the examples, about, they're about binaries. And these binaries are essentially like things like trying to identify, say, a dog or a bagel or something along those lines, right? And in a computer, if you've given enough dogs versus bagels comparison and in supervised learning, Label the dogs and label the bagels, bagels, et cetera. And then supervise learning. You can say that essentially in those scenarios, it's eventually going to be able to distinguish between the dog and the bagels in with some sort of way of, of making this distinction um, that may not be humanly explainable, but that will be from its training data, right? But when we come back to examples of like, you know, this really crude dichotomy, refugee or terrorist, or examples like between, you know, the, uh, um, the children and some people versus non-innocent people, et cetera, that's a lot harder to program for, right? Imagine trying to create a database of, say, we can get a database probably using Amazon's Mechanical Turk and people labeling the images, but you probably put together a database of 400 dogs flying in a circle and 400 babies, right? Relatively easily to feed the machine. Imagine the difficulty of trying to do that with, say, asylum seekers or something like that, right? What would be the relevant data set? And this is where I think is really important about the nature of the types of AI involved, is that a lot of times people are too focused on the algorithm or on things like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, the very complex apparatus of uh, the computer science jargon around AI. And what they, they forget to challenge is the fundamental problem of like the nature of the distinctions being very binary, binaristic, and the difficulty of putting together a convincingly broad data set. That I think is the key. That you you probably are never going to be able to put together a data set on the stuff that I'm mentioning that's broad enough that would reflect even something as you know strange but but entertaining as like dogs versus bagels. Um, I will say though, maybe there are some places where you could have automation of law. Okay, like for example, red light cameras. Right, and I don't know what the situation is here with red light cameras, but you know this is one where it seems like it's relatively easy to adjudicate. Um, the person goes under the, the car drives under the red light, you know, it doesn't really matter if it just turned red after it turned yellow, but you're still liable, et cetera. The law can be very clear about that. Um, and we can imagine a future where it automatically debits the right bank account or appears on the tax and state return, et cetera. And, you know, that's all aspects of automation of law. Even there, people have said, well, what if someone else is driving your car? Well, we could add facial recognition, right? But even there, it starts getting a little creepy in terms of like saying, well, you know, to have the facial recognition on at all times. Although we do have something called automated license plate readers, but of course those are again focused on the car and not on the person. Um, so I think, but I think also what's possible, where I predict this would really go, uh, become extremely broad, would be if people were given, say, a discount on their driver's license or anything like that. I bet you would see a lot of people opt in just saying, oh yeah, if I can get $50 off, let me opt in. Right. And so I think this is another area where we should watch for uh, uh, computerization, but not that objectionable to me. However, other legal scholars do worry, right? Joel Christensen has argued that these sort of cameras violate the ability of due process and violate the right to confront your accuser. And I think it's a really interesting issue. Um, Chad Squidieri uh, at Catholic University has written some very interesting stuff on the Sixth Amendment right to confront, confront its accusers. And the idea being, like, is the computer your accuser? And are you able to, in some way, interface with it, right? And that's one reason why, even with red light cameras, jurisdictions like New York City have a rule that say that the uh, uh, image from the red light camera has to go to a person who does a double check, and that person effectively is the accuser, not the computer. So that's a kind of interesting sort of idea, right? Even in something that seems so simple, seems like the most direct, easiest case of automation of law, you still have jurisdictions like New York interposing the person. Now, to play devil's advocate to my own devil's advocate, is that really legit or is that just feather bedding to give another person a job? I don't know. Right? 
<laughs> but I do think that it is an interesting sort of thing to, to think about in terms of our uh, I think common worries about this type of a system. Now, I'd also note too that there are some, uh, uh, another aspect of algorithmic social justice is that I have to acknowledge, I mean, I've been sort of framing civil rights on the side of challenges to automation. One should acknowledge though that some civil rights advocates say they like the red light cameras more than, say, human sheriffs because they, they trust the cameras more. And so that has to be sort of, I think, dealt with. I think that has to be part of the conversation as well. Um, and I think as well, we would like to be um, automation of talent. So I mentioned earlier that there, there uh, was worry about confronting one's accuser. Eventually, I think you'll see things like apps that will allow you to uh, automate your challenge. So you might have essentially, just like we have in the stock market with high frequency trading, we have bots speaking bots. You might have your bot speaking with the traffic department bot, et cetera, as being the future of enforcement. I mean, that, that's uh, one far-fetched future, but I think it's, it's, it's worth uh, considering. To go a little bit further here, I want to think about embedding private security in storing infrastructure. Right? So I've talked about like the state doing it. What about private parties? Right? I talked about earlier protests being met by police with drones. What about, say, the people who are protesting against yes, using drones? Right? And here, here's an example of, say, embedding private security in AI in store infrastructure. So you might imagine an automated kiosk, which is run by a store, and it is, uh, has to deal with, or it has to decide whether to alert people to attend to a customer. And in general, it doesn't want to do this. Like if you've ever used a phone tree, you know that like they try to keep you away from a person for as long as possible. There's even a website called gethuman.org that tells you how to get to a human out of the phone tree. These sorts of things would also want to keep you away from a person. And you can imagine this chain of, chain of stores recording its customers for thousands of hours, develop a database, and you can have one subroutine of the system detecting violence and either dispatching an assistant manager to attend to an aggravated customer or a security guard for an enraged or suspicious one. Again, these binaries, right? Keep it in the store, bring in the police, right? Very difficult to sort of think about like, you know, where exactly this is going to go with AI, but I think it's a definite possibility. And that, again, is something that I want to question as a future of AI and law because it uses something called affective computing. And there's been a lot of questions raised about affective computing. Essentially, in affective computing, these chatbots, AI, et cetera, are trying to figure out what people are feeling, what people are thinking and feeling. And to use affective computing to determine whether to say, put someone in one category or another, depends again on having a reliable database of images. And yet we all know that human expressions, human ways of reacting, et cetera, evolve over time. So the problem becomes that a lot of times you may have a system that may well be based on a certain set of data but is not really extrapolable to all situations, making important decisions. And then I think, you know, as it's adopted in these different contexts, we have to worry about it. It's not all as simple as like surprise, right? This is a Microsoft sort of facial uh, recognition and parsing system. It has eight different types of uh, possibilities, obviously surprise, right? So that's the model, but there are other problems where we might essentially see these aggression detectors, other things, not being able to fit someone into one of the existing categories. And we've got to worry, I think, about that because it's not just happening in law in general, it's happening with HR, it's happening in all these other areas. Um, I also should note, too, that there are concerns about bias. Again, you know, that uh, Lauren Rue is a researcher at the Information School at the University of Maryland. She's found that uh, black men's facial expressions are associated with emotions associated with threatening behaviors, more often than white men, even when smiling. This again is a huge problem with these databases, right? That we have to really be able to question them and to say, are there problems, biases, other things that are not really reflecting reality, but that are just part of a data residue, right? Um, I'd also note too, that if you have systems like this deciding who say gets the police and who gets say to be dealt with by members of people in the store, they can be privacy invasion, right? Jennifer Bard has a wonderful article called Developing a Legal Framework AI, it says, is this like these bots? And I think that's a great question. Do we want to create sort of AIs that can be billed as reading bots? And this raises even further questions, right? What is emotional state? What are emotional states? What is affect? To Bard, it can be three different things. It can be uh, a reflection of biometric data, 
right? You just say, well, it's pure biometric data that I'm analyzing when I say that someone is a suspicious person. That doesn't seem quite right. Right? I mean, it's like it's something more than biometric to say that person's suspicious. I'm sorry. I timed to give myself about five minutes, so this is perfect. Um, <laughs> and so that I think is about the um, that's a, that's a problem. The other is that it could be sort of an indication of beliefs, but do we really think a machine can read our beliefs? Right. One problem becomes if we if enough people do then at least it can attribute the beliefs to you. And this, I think, is like a really difficult problem with like AI assessing individuals because what's often happening in these scenarios is that they like to call it, they like to say, we are reading your emotion using affective computing. But what they're really doing is attributing emotion. There's a really big difference between attribution. And I was recently debating this with some researchers at uh, Cornell Tech. Um, Digital Life Initiative there had a uh, seminar called Being Human in a Digitized World. And one of the articles that's coming out of this is called uh, How Legible Should Humans Be to Machines? And I had to challenge the metaphor of legibility because I do think it's something of a power play. And this is something I was only led to, I have to acknowledge, by a, a brilliant uh, theorist of technology named Rob Ford, uh, who used to run Real Life Magazine for Snap, uh, formerly, or formerly Snapchat. Um, unfortunately, Real Life Magazine has gone away, but I highly recommend they put about 120 of their articles online as podcasts. And they're, they're brilliant. And what Rob, you know, insisted as we were, we were talking about this issue was to say, is this really an attribution? I think it's really an important thing to think about in terms of that. Uh, uh, and I also think some of these technologies as well say that they can create emotion or evoke emotion in people. But at what point does it become creation or evocation or evocation of emotion? And at what point is it manipulation? And the last point I want to make here is, you know, in thinking about like these reading thoughts and feelings, what if what the emotion AI collects is sensitive information? That's where it's almost like a diagnosis, right? At some point, the AI can say not just that someone's suspicious, but that someone is like a mental health risk. And if we look at how mass, the, the discourse of mental health and mass shootings has sort of been intertwined over the past several years, that's another clear and present danger here, right? Um, and I think what it reminds me of this possibility of AI making uh, sub rosa mental health diagnoses of everybody um, is troubling. Now, I think that if it's in the context of a doctor saying this is a facial screening technology that will help us do a depression screening faster and more accurately than we would in person, or at least to supplement my judgment, I'm fine with it. But if it's sort of uh, just you out in machines with no personal relationship, I'm troubled with it. And, there, and one reason why I just wanted to bring up this cold water controversy from 1964. Um, uh, Barry Goldwater was a Republican presidential nominee in 1964. And Life magazine published an article by a psychiatrist saying he is clinically insane and therefore cannot be president. Okay. Well, he sued for defamation and won. Um, and one of the reasons he won is because there was a great deal of concern about whether one could actually do a distant diagnosis, right? One can do a distant characterization of the actions and behavior of an individual. But the nature of diagnosis, at least within a professionalized mental health system, is that you actually have to have some personal relationship with the person and to understand them on a person-to-person -person level. And ultimately, the American Psycho Psychological Association uh, decided, or Psychiatric Association, I'm forgetting, the, the Association of Psychiatrists, whatever that is, decided that as a matter of professional integrity, psychiatrists should not make those sorts of assessments. Um, fast forward 50 years, controversy grew again. I think about, I think 12 psychiatrists uh, led by someone at Yale actually wrote something relatively similar about Trump, but got a lot less traction in the media, I think in part because there was the ethical concern. It's a very interesting sort of issue to think about in terms of like how distant analyses, even by persons in the mental health context, are troubling, and how they can be more troubling than human beings. So in thinking about, you know, this, what issues are raised, you know, my concluding thoughts here are that there are so many things that AI can add to law. I think that it can, when transparent, when fully explainable, when uh, put in settings where judges and decision makers really understand it, can add a lot. But I raised a lot of questions today. <laughs> and I think there are a set of questions that I would encourage everyone here uh, to raise when you're confronted with an AI innovation in law, particularly when the argument is that it's going to be a lot better than because I feel like that often there are people 
in legal positions who are not doing that great a job in terms of creating a good baseline. But the answer is not to just sweep them aside and put in computation, but instead I think often to find how can computation and these forms of uh, AI augment existing professional intelligence, professionals intelligence, rather than replacing them. So with that, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay, Frank has uh, made himself available for some questions. I'm going to just stop uh, the live stream. Well, so sounds good. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I'd love to just have a conversation with uh, questions. Yes, yeah. Or oh, I'm sorry, did you want to start, Maddie? Or did I, did you want, um, I, I started. Oh, God. Sorry, I, I, 